So um, um, we're going to spend a, about an hour uh, looking at the Learn Moodle curriculum that we're building and then take a short coffee break. And when we come back from the coffee break, um, we're doing a, a brief workshop on, on planning uh, when building Moodle courses. And so um, uh, pay attention for this first section because as we go into the second section, uh, we'll really uh, be interested in, 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 your, uh, in your feelings about planning and your thoughts. Um, so uh, we're building a new training course for Moodle, which is very different from anything we've done before. Um, in the past, we, we've had uh, uh, certifications that uh, really asked people to be software experts. And, um, and they were good certifications. They were very hard. Uh, I have trouble passing some of them. Um, but, uh, and I've been using Moodle since 2003. Um, but but um, at the same time, it wasn't necessarily helping us become better teachers. And so that became uh, a new project for us. Martin has said in his keynotes a couple times that using Moodle is like driving a car. And, and I think it's a reasonable metaphor. It's a good metaphor. Um, uh, you really just want to give teachers car keys so they can drive. And, and you know, many of us know many teachers that can just do that. Um, but you know, online teaching demands different things from us, uh, just like driving does. Some trains are more challenging than others in terms of driving and teaching. Um, other trains require very, very specific skills. Um, and you have to be a different driver uh, in different locations. You know, cities ask something different of you. And you've got to be prepared for different patterns in places that you go just like when you're teaching in a classroom and going from room to room or from school to school or from city to city or country to country. And it matters where your driving is located. This is actually a road in South America. And this, this is a road in Canada where she lives. Here is someone who needs more training for snow. And here's someone who needs more auto insurance. Um, we know that drivers come in all shapes and sizes. Some are highly trained. Some are very, very fast. And many drivers are learning on the roads. So we've got to think about those teachers, too, when they're just learning. And the older I get, the younger the drivers and teachers seem to be. So while teaching online is like driving, um, we need something better than manuals to prepare us for the diversity of the roads we're on, for the diversity of the environments, for the traffic patterns, and those experiences. And no matter how good the manual you might have, uh, we need something to prepare us to be the kind of drivers everyone trusts and understands. So last May, Martin asked me to build a team that could write a Moodle curriculum that could support 124 million learners. I used to be a carefree young man. <laughs> but this big responsibility has aged me quite a bit. Uh, my own history is being the son of a school teacher who was the son of a school bus driver. I always wanted to be a teacher because that's really the best way I know to learn things. And on my teaching journey, after about 12 years teaching in a high school, I met people that influenced my teaching. And uh, with my friends, I co-founded a Moodle partner company called Moodle Rooms. And Moodle Rooms grew to a staff of about, that looks like a blank screen, of about 100 people. Um, you know, meeting that staff, uh, training that staff, learning from that staff is something I'm incredibly proud of. We knew a lot about Moodle, we learned a lot about schools, and we learned a lot about um, learning. Uh, we went to extremes to celebrate Moodle and uh, to make it known. 
And I can tell that that same thing is happening right now in India. You know, I've, I've met Moodle partners here, and uh, the staffs are connecting distances and uh, distances between people and places. And Moodle is growing so quickly here. Uh, I think it takes everybody in this room to be an advocate and a friend to all the Moodle schools and Moodle organizations and companies that will need guidance. So people know how to drive Moodle. But they aren't always practiced at certain things, like parking. So you can train somebody to park. Um, or they're not necessarily good at passing. You can do a little bit of training about passing, because this will be universal in your driving. You can help people with taking curves. There are things that we can teach millions and millions of Moodlers to do well that are not overwhelmingly difficult to do. Uh, we think of these as teaching patterns. It's not the perfect word, teaching patterns. Um, uh, we thought about calling it different things, like Moodle moves or something. They're like dance steps. They're things that, as teachers, we know, we move, and and uh, and and that's what we do. You know, when when you when you have trouble in the classroom, you know how to fix it by by uh, you know following a pattern. And 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 there's many many universal patterns that really uh, uh, can be shared and can be shared specifically um, in Moodle as ways to solve problems. So our curriculum consists of these teaching patterns. And we have about 24 of them right now. And they look simple. Um, and they are simple. I, I, I don't want to make this sound incredibly complicated. But, but you know, in, in the US, when students need help, they are trained to raise their hand and ask for help. But how do you do that in Moodle? You know, and, and how do you do that better than you would in a classroom in Moodle? And how do then we learn from each other about the best ways to help learners learn to ask for help? That's a long, long sentence. Um, so in raising a hand, in the module that we would teach, we would have three examples. And we'd say, uh, here's one way to uh, uh, have students ask questions. You know, OK, maybe it's a forum, right? It, it, maybe it's a forum. That could be a passive forum, which could be useful. Um, but but we, you know, here we can articulate it and say, just this is a good idea. This is how you might use Moodle to ask questions. Maybe you want to do something where you have the students teach each other uh, answers to some questions, right? A little bit of peer help. So what can you do in Moodle to create uh, some peer responsiveness to each other when someone needs help? Uh, so this is what we do. We, we basically say, this pattern works. There might be a better one, but this has worked for us. You know? and, then, and then try this one, try this one. And then in the course, we actually challenge people to, to build that into their course, that, that move, that, that, was, that dance combo, that, 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 that pattern, teaching pattern, that can then open up what's happened in the class. And raising a hand sounds really simple, but, but when you're alone and a learner and lost, you know, it's, it's very important. So you know, we're just bringing these to mind. And, 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 and so far, you know, we're learning that many teachers bring these things to mind. Um, another example of a pattern would be an online jigsaw. Is that a term you use here? Jigsaw being the kind of teaching pattern where, uh, uh, as an instructor, you want you know, everyone in the class to study something different and then to bring all those parts together and explain them and report on that. It's so that one person doesn't have to study everything, but one person studies something, and then the, the classmates. So, so in, a, in a classroom, it's pretty easy. We could do that with tables, right? I could reach out and ask you guys to do something special for me and you to do something special for me. And you know the role. You know, you feel that responsibility. You feel that connection to the instructor. You, you, you just, 
You want to own it. You want to get your part right. You want to feel all of that as a student and as a learner. It doesn't matter if you're an elementary school student. It doesn't matter if you're uh, you know, a surgeon. You really want to be part of, of, of that activity. So how do you do that online? How do you do that in Moodle especially? You know, this could be a, a glossary that you're using. You know, this could be a database that you're using. I always fall back to forums. I use forums whenever I possibly can um, because it's got that great interactivity that you can have. So this is another pattern, online jigsaws. Study guides as success predictors. You know, I've, I've taught people how to use Moodle for years, and I was struck by the, by the whole idea that, you know, students will read your syllabus in, in your class and say, oh, I got it. I got this. I understand everything that you've asked me to do. And then the second something is laid or the second something is fails or the second something goes wrong, they have no idea that there was a syllabus, you know? So this is one of those things that you can do online that's easier than doing things in person. You know, the pattern there can be, okay, here's my syllabus, here's a quiz on my syllabus, and find out how well they do. And, and again, it's not for a grade per se, but you could unlock using restricted access the rest of the course depending on the fact that they understood your syllabus. So some great Moodle tools to help enact some of these, these patterns and, and make your job as an instructor easier because now you know that they know what they need to know. Another long sentence. Uh, blended learning. How many of you struggle, like I do, with um, having students in a room and having students do stuff online and you wonder, which do I do where and why? You know, is that an issue for others, blended learning? It's, it's that opportunity, right? Especially with reluctant teachers. You know, partly we're reluctant to, to jump into online learning because we love teaching in classrooms. And, and who wants to give up the thing they love, right? You've, you've got to do something and say, well, I'm going to separate out certain things to do online. And I'm going to keep things to do online as well, right? So we're thinking about patterns where, as instructors, you can help make those decisions or, or uh, uh, decide what you keep and what you let go of. I lost so many of my students uh, essays when they submitted them to me and and I you know they, they had copies um, but but somehow physically I would pick them up and I would put them in my bag and by the time I checked them off on my list uh, you know I was missing two and they were in the wrong pile um, and so I went to Moodle early in 2003 2004 and said Moodle do the things I'm bad at you know. And it was so good at it. It was so good at handling assignments and telling me exactly when someone submitted something. And I didn't have to worry about uh, my own weaknesses. So in blended learning, I think that way. I think about what you're going to give up and what you're going to keep and what, what advantages will come out of this for you. So I'm actually going to go through a list of some of these. I won't probably go into the same amount of detail. but. I'm interested in seeing if these connect with you. So just, just you know, give it a little bit time to wash over you. You know, course progress indicators. Uh, do you are, you, are you absolutely sure all of your students know where they are in your course? Am I a quarter of the way through? Am I halfway through? You know, a little bit of progress indicators would be great, right? I mean, I'm sure you would like to know if I have 10 slides left or 20. Right or 200. Um, uh, it's it's just something nice to have uh, uh, for that student, and 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 sometimes it's because uh, it helps them learn, it helps them stay positive, it helps them be organized. But in in other ways, uh, it it's it, it helps you. Um, it really um, keeps that relationship with them more positive because they're not confused. Communicating course expectations. You know, that moment, <laughs> that moment when you think everyone is on the same page in your class and that, you, that they know what's going to happen in this next moment, but, but then they start talking and you realize they don't. And, 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 uh, and, and you 
spent you know a whole day talking about this with your department, but uh, not with your students. So like, how do you set those course expectations? How do you let students know what's important to you? You know, these could be lists of competencies. Um, you could even uh, break uh, the activities into the competencies and say, if you want to exercise this competency, be looking at this and this and this assignment because that's where I'm going to be looking. Um, uh, many ways to establish course expectations. Or instructor presence. How do they know who you are? How do they know what you want from them? Video gives us this amazing opportunity. You know, we can, we can say things to people in a video, and they can get, get more than they might from a paragraph of instructions. And if you start thinking about the teachers that are especially responsive to all of their students, and they know that some people don't read as much and as carefully as they should, you know, you can put a paragraph of, of the assignment um, there, and then videotape yourself talking about it. So you are reasserting information you want them to know. But this is you. This is your instructor presence. This is saying that it matters to you that they understand what's important about the activity. And they're, they're going to want to do well by you. you know? they're, they want to know who you are and what matters to you. And they're going to try to meet that mattering map. right? Peer feedback. In a classroom, it's very difficult to do great peer feedback. Um, at least I found it challenging. And I was teaching you know, literature, where you got to talk about books and poems and stories. I, I, how difficult it is, is it in math? You know, I know it's difficult. I know it's difficult to do that in science. But there are real ways to address that in Moodle. You know, you can set up ratings where students are saying, good job, that made sense to me. I have no idea what you're talking about, you know. Uh, and, and that kind of feedback will raise everybody higher. And the fact that all of the burden is not on your shoulders as an instructor really makes more things possible. So peer feedback as, as a move, as a pattern, um, uh, can, can change the dynamic of your classroom. Um, you know, you've got the quiet students who don't say much, but as soon as they do say something and their peers say, wonderful, that's fantastic, everything changes. It's like the chemical uh, in, in the whole class changes and everyone feels different. And then, of course, there's instructor feedback. <laughs> I don't know how much we want to say about that, but, um, you know, there are rubrics. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there's positive things you can say. There are um, uh, different ways you can help people with process or with uh, behaviors or with, uh, uh, you know, those non-cognitive pieces like resilience. Um, when the student fails a quiz on Wednesday and doesn't come back to the course for two weeks, you know, this, this is an opportunity to talk to them about resilience and say, you know, uh, I didn't expect that. I didn't want you to go away. Um, you know, maybe I need to do my quizzes differently, but what I want you to know is that uh, uh, I'm not done with you, and, and if you fail, well, you won't next time. So we have in this course at least three examples, in each of these courses, three examples and three challenges where we ask you to say, how would you do this? How would you do this? Come up with a better way than ours, which we know you'll do. Um, and and that's, that's very moodly, you know, for us to say, well, okay, here's our try. You know, what did we get right? What did we get wrong? Let's make this better together. Teaching patterns like learner-centered paths. So Michelle was just talking about um, her classroom where she has students learning different things at different times. You know, and, and that, that can be very difficult. In Moodle, it can be pretty simple. Um, I, I'm reminded in, in the US, we have kindergarten rooms, um, which, which are you know, regular size rooms, but there are often stations against each wall where here's where I learn about my colors, 
and here's where I learn about my shapes, and here's where I learn about my numbers and my alphabet. And students move from place to place to place. It's not chaotic. You know, it's, it's learning, and it's people who are going to those spaces, to those stations, at their own time, at their own pace. And, and, and the teacher's just really checking off to see when mastery is reached in each of, each of these areas. They become the facilitator to make sure that people are moving through all of the stations that are necessary. And you can do that with learner-centered paths. You can make a topic for each of these areas in your Moodle course. And not matter what order or sequence they go through if it doesn't matter. If it does matter, you do something different. But if it doesn't matter, then why not let the person chart their own path across that ocean? You know, they'll, they'll feel as if they've uh, uh, had more responsibility that way. Or maybe even ask those learners to curate their own resources. So maybe you're going to do a study about um, uh, plants. And, and instead of giving them a large list of plants, they go and make a list of plants, and they put it in the glossary. And you ask them to, to find things and detail things and make their own resources. And then they make decisions about stuff that they've found. And it's all about ownership. It's all about learning. And again, this happens to young children. This happens to, to adults. You know, if, if we said to you, you don't have to sit through two days of linear workshops. You just go and hang out with what you, who you want to hang out with and then move through. You know, it would be a very different experience for you. You know, you might really enjoy that more. Can't pull it off in a room as well as we can online. And then there's, there's practice, right? There's that moment where you're saying to your students, I have 5,000 questions in my question bank and you need to learn all of these by the end of the year. So is it important that you slowly give everybody those quiz questions? What if you put them all in a quiz on the first day and then just have a forum sitting right next to it? And you say, the grade that matters is the average of all of these quizzes, and I'm letting you do unlimited quizzes. Go. You know, and then suddenly you've got those students who are just going, 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 and learning, and learning, and learning, and learning. And they've got it done in two weeks. And someone else is going to take two months. But, you know, why are we preventing them from doing that? You know, it's practice. And, and we can have that same quiz with the same questions later on. And it could be, you know, a high-stakes quiz assessment. And we can get all the information we need to secure our, you know, integrity of our jobs. But, but, but those students have, you know, they're learners. And, 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 and having that opportunity to get better and know they're not failures, you know? That kid who left on Wednesday because he got a D, uh, it didn't matter because he could come back the next day and get an A and then average that out. I, I think that's the kind of message we want to be giving people. And we can. It's, it's, uh, the technology is allowed for it. If I were going to do that with papers in my classroom, I would lose even more papers because I'd be trying to handle all of those iterations of all of the students in different places and so forth. And that's why we have technology. Take that work away from us. And then portfolios. You know, that moment where you're saying to your learner, uh, okay, you're going to be a policeman, and you've gone through all of this training, and there's this important idea that we have about public safety. And I want you to go through this course and look at examples of where you address that issue in a discussion and submit that as a portfolio and explain why and how you addressed it. You know, for a person to be able to know what it is that they're being measured by and look for good examples of that competency within the system uh, gives them a, a, a much, you know, different relationship with, with the course, you know, with the instructor and with themselves because there's, there's nothing that uh, uh, is, is being kept from them. They've been told at the very beginning about how they could be a learner and, um, uh, and, and how, what will be expected from them. So, you know, they might even also participate more because they know at the end they have to select the best of. Um, and if you've only done it once or twice in a discussion or something, it's not a lot to select from. I promise these don't go on forever. But uh, values clarification. You know, in, in teaching, 
there's a lot of classrooms where, where there's a lot of sense making going on, where, where, where the group has to decide a little bit about, uh, about where they stand on an issue or, or uh, you know, the ethics of something. And, and uh, you know, for many of us um, who studied to be teachers through a process or studied to be teachers through content, um, in, when it comes to like, you know, values clarification and sense making, it's really hard and just seems very, very difficult to do because, um, you know, conversations happen so fast and it's hard to reply to everybody. But, you know, if you think about doing this online, time stops. You know, when someone replies in a forum, you have some time to think about it before you have to reply back. You know, and you want to give them the encouragement that will help them. Uh, you want to maybe slap someone's hand if they were uh, inappropriate to somebody else. Uh, it's, it's, it's not that rush of ocean that's happening in your regular classroom where you can't stop the wave because time is moving. In an online environment, you can stop all of that and, and worry and think about sense making and, and giving people a chance to, to reply. Uh, Moodle, you know, comes from that social constructionist um, uh, pedagogy background. It was designed with that in mind. It was Martin's PhD. And uh, he just, he was really curious about how people make sense of learning and how they learn together. And so we have a bunch of tools in Moodle that are really, really appropriate for that. And again, they'll take the burden off your shoulders and they'll let you do things that you can't do in a regular classroom. Um, I know a lot of us think about critical thinking um, you know, as an expression of writing. And writing takes a long time to practice. And, uh, and as a writing teacher, I thought about it quite a bit. But, but you know, you know if, if I'm teaching science, I'm also thinking about those critical thinking words. Are people understanding what they need to understand? Um, online, you can search for those. You can build little patterns where you're uh, uh, thinking about process with people, where you're tweaking uh, their comments until, until they're using the language that you know they need in order to express what they need to express. I know many of you think of in terms of problem-based learning. You know, PBL is really amazing and not easy necessarily. Um, it, I think it becomes more natural the more you do it. But there are definitely sequences. Let's do this and then let's do this after this. Oops, sorry. And then let's do this after that. And uh, you know, it might be uh, doing a, a, a choice group to go into a forum, to have separate discussions, and then you, people build something in a wiki. Um, you know, there are a number of patterns that, that we think really aids problem-based learning activities. And, um, and, and if you wanna try it out, if you wanna make those moves, it could probably um, uh, change your teaching a little bit. When I think of group roles, um, uh, I, I think of you know, the responsibility of the person within a group. Um, oh, how, how do I get through here? Uh, Martin, you were in, uh, oh, I didn't mean to, uh, you were in, where was it? Um, uh, Israel? And, and uh, they were doing a, a little uh, dev jam there and they had to come up with specific kind of Moodle activities, new ones that had never been made before. And they came up with this idea of top rope. I think I got that right. And the top rope is like climbing, climbing a mountain. And everyone's on the rope. And everyone has, uh, has to like, you know, learn something to get the other people up the rope. And, and when you think about those group roles and, and tuning people to understand that they don't have to do everything, but they have to do something very well, otherwise everyone might slip off that mountainside. You know, they might not learn what they need to learn. Um, then, then you're doing a great deal of teaching. Uh, I think it's also important just to say, uh, you know, mobile learning is very different. Um, it's, it's a different, if, if classroom teaching to online teaching is a leap, it's also a leap to, online, uh, to, to, to mobile learning because you, you want to think about that device differently, right? It's not like you want to do everything that you would do on a laptop. You want to do different things. You want to take pictures and submit that as your assignment and uh, you want to measure things and you want to capture things differently, have different kinds of conversations, different lengths. And so, you know, I, th I think as we 
uh, grow with Moodle, all of us, and we teach each other patterns about, you know, hey, I just did this, this series of activities with mobile that was fantastic. This is the way we begin to share them with each other. Um, and reflection, I'm skipping to reflection. Uh, it's a hard one to do. I mean, I think a lot of us will say, well, how did that go? And, and a student can say, well, you know, I hated it. And then you move on. Uh, but, but, you know, how many of us use some of the tools that are in Moodle on day one? The survey, you know. Have you ever used the, the Moodle native survey by any chance? Yeah. So it asks the students in the class, when did you feel connected today? When did someone look at you and talk to you or respond to you and make you feel like you mattered? Uh, uh, when did you feel disconnected? You know, and for a lot of teachers, if, if, you know, you know you've had a bad day, and then if you ask your students then, if they ever felt disconnected and all of them did, you know, uh, uh, it could be, you know, heart shattering. But, you know, it's research. It's research that something went wrong, you know, and what was it that went wrong so that I just don't have to have this happen to me again? Um, so I uh, really believe that reflection is, is a way for us to uh, uh, ask students what went well, what didn't go well, and, uh, and what do we need to change so that won't happen again. So I'm going to pause for three, four minutes. Um, I've got all of them up on the board, and, and I'm not sure if you've seen them. Uh, uh, if you can see them in the back, and I apologize. But as I've listed these patterns, has something bubbled in your head of, oh, he missed that? You know, what, what did I miss? Um, what did we miss? We've been trying to connect them and time to different things we've read and research. Uh, my email address is tom at moodle.com. I'm just going to shut up for a minute. And I would just love to hear if, you know, what, what you think in terms of teaching patterns. You know, little, little moves that you know as a teacher that you do online again and again and again in different shapes um, uh, that it might help a new teacher, driver. You know, might help a driver in a different country. Might help a driver on a different mountain. Might help a driver in a different city. And, and just, just, just send it to me. No high pressure, but I'm going to shut up. Four, four minutes. Yes. Courses and the content to be interoperable, and also integrating OERs from different sources. For example, if I want to embed Scratch in yes. Moodle or Turtle in Moodle, mm -hmm. I'm not really sure whether it's already there or not. Just a it's not on this list, it's on our want to do list. And if, if one, two, three, four, five people say it's important, we would love to do it. Absolutely. Those things do become priorities, right? You know, uh, using other tools inside this tool. Exactly right. I guess I don't hear you. Ah, right. OK. So the question was, how do you make learner portfolios in Moodle if there isn't a built-in um, Moodle portfolio? In this case, we've been using assignments. It's something that people submit. The positive thing about that is that you've got the nice uh, 
advanced grading uh, rubrics and marking. And, and you can, of course, tie that to competencies within Moodle and, and collect that. I know calling it assignment makes it feel unportfolio-ish. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, patterns are suggestions. Um, there are a number of really good portfolio plugins as well. Exavis, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Uh, very good. Um, and, and it also has a competency structure, which is complementary to Moodle. Okay, so now I'm gonna dig into the course itself, the module, which is in five parts. And uh, just, you know, what we're aware of when we think about all of these teachers that we want to involve in a discussion about teaching and learning is, um, uh, we can't be sloppy. You know, we, we have to pretty much model some excellent habits. And, and these are the things that often many of us, you know, don't necessarily do in our classrooms day for day because it takes a long time. But, but um, uh, uh, I, think, I think it'll be interesting to me to hear from the folks that go through the courses uh, whether they think it's difficult at all uh, or just good habits. So, uh, the first thing we do is really the introduction to programming considerations. Think of this as, as topic one in your Moodle course. Uh, we have a, a module guide, we use the book for that, and, and really try to uh, set everything up correctly where this is about the program, about Learn Moodle, this is about the module, you know, this is what you can find inside. We're focused on, on learner portfolios in this one. Here's a little bit of research around learner portfolios. This is what we're measuring, and I'll talk more about that. Um, uh, here's your instructor, here's how to communicate with the instructor, and, and here is how we have planned for your success. That sounds odd, but um, we'll be talking more about that too. We give them a pre-experience survey. At the end, we, teach, we do a post-experience survey, so we can compare the two. And we have a discussion with the participants about the pattern in their current teaching experience. Because, yes, everyone has done this before. Right? So if you say, uh, how do you set course expectations? It's not as if people come to the table with no experience. Um, and, and almost immediately, hopefully, from the start in this class, we want people to know that you know, teachers are learners and learners are teachers. And, uh, and, and we're just trying to articulate what it is that's important about setting course expectations from the start. By the time we move to section two of the course, it's act one. And this is where we're sharing exemplars. And this is something we've learned a great deal, uh, and Solange will talk more about, uh, from doing moots, from having people look at our curriculum so far. Um, because the thing that we're asked for most are examples. Can you give me an example of good Moodle courses? Can you give me an example of good um, uh, Moodle course lets, the atomic pieces? Um, the stuff that uh, uh, Photon is thinking about, those smaller pieces, right? And, 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 and what happens with those exemplars? So, you know, we're, we're giving them three examples. Um, uh, we have a video. Uh, it's it's uh, Mary Cooch, uh, the wonderful Moodle um, uh, uh, voice. Who, who does all of the new 3.4, 3.5 kind of presentations. Now she goes through each of our examples and says, um, oh, the forum is really good for these reasons, you know, and, and it's very useful in this, uh, in this case, and, and here's how we set up this activity. Um, I uh, turn editing on and go in and, and build it. Because this is not supposed to be a mystery to anybody, right? We're giving them an example, so we really want to show them how to do it. Uh, the, the screencast follows people through the learning. And then, and then we reiterate all of that information in a step-by-step -step process. So people can, uh, if, if they uh, uh, don't want to listen to Mary, they can just read you know, that input. And then we have a discussion about, uh, uh, with, with the people in the class about uh, whether they would address the patterns the same way, whether they understood things, whether they uh, would do it differently, and so forth but it's all about the examples. And then, uh, act two is really about um, designing things. It's saying, okay, we're gonna give you three challenges. 
challenge number one corresponds with example number one, challenge number two corresponds with example number two, and, and what we'd like you to do is, is not think um, uh, theoretically, think practically. How would you do this in the course you are responsible for, right? So um, you teach a maths class, you know, how would you do this move? Um, uh, you teach a uh, foreign language, how would you bust this move? Um, and then this gives us like three entryways at least of uh, uh, people um, learning tools. And, and this is an important part because we've not left this out, though this is the first time I'm speaking of it. We have self-paced courses that are tucked into these courses that teach how to use the tools. Because that's important too, right? You want to know how to use a quiz if you're being if you're using quiz in the middle of, of a sequence. Um, so so we're, we let people kind of disappear for a second and learn how to use the quiz a little bit better if they didn't know it before, and then come back into the, the pattern course and, and you know, do that pattern. Now they have all that help that we've given them in the example. They had all the steps. They had all this process, and they're just re replicating that, but, but now they understand the tools better as well. And we have discussions with them to make sure that uh, uh, to understand what they discovered in the process of building their challenges. In Act 3, uh, we do something called demonstrating achievement. And this is uh, what, what we have in a, the portfolio module as well, which is saying, you know, there are four things that as teachers that we think it's pretty wise to watch out for and plan for. So where did you plan for this? when you were building your challenges? Okay, four questions. We're gonna delve into more of those in the next hour. But what was the evidence of your innovation? You know, when were you being creative in this course? I don't know if you remember, but at the very beginning in the about module, we told them where uh, we thought they could uh, be innovative, where they could be creative. And so here the question is, where are you? And if so, catch yourself doing it and share that with us. Um, when did you think about exactly what you wanted your learners to learn uh, when you were building these courses? When did you plan to be responsive to everybody? You know, this isn't a teaching to the top of the class. This isn't teaching just to the bottom of the class. This isn't teaching to the middle of the class. Where did you try to cover everybody and, and maybe modulate the activity a little bit so everyone was covered? And then what was the evidence of, of your engagement? When did you get people talking? When did you get them moving? When did you get them doing peer reviews? When did you get them uh, 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 learning from each other? Like you can in social constructionism. And then finally, we wrap up section five of the Moodle course with connection. Now this is where you connect your learning to other things that you already know, right? You do a little post-experience survey. What's different for you now than was from when you started the, the, the survey um, or the module. Uh, you're doing a discussion about what you would take away to share with, with uh, colleagues. You know, that, that actually, I always forget the name of it, but, but when people talk about products, you know, there's all the research that you could do about a product, but the best thing you can actually do is say, would you tell your friend to buy this product? Um, you know, th that's kind of what's happening here. Uh, 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 would you take this away to share with a, a colleague? You know, I think all of us know that our teaching colleagues are rarely um, patient enough to uh, talk about teaching unless it's a really good idea. Um, uh, that sounds harsh, but, but uh, you, you know you're not going to share a dumb idea with a colleague. Um, so, so if there's an opportunity to say, no, this, this, I think this is going to change my teaching. I'm interested in you understanding this too. Uh, maybe we can work on this together. It's interesting. And then uh, a questioning process, which again, this is modeling. So, so we're doing it, so you do it too. What would you change in the module if you could change anything? The goal here is to think of ourselves and teaching as being a research product. You know, this is, this is not um, uh, a moment where, 
you know, suddenly Tom became a teacher and he doesn't have to think about it anymore. Um, uh, it just doesn't work, right? There's that moment where teaching has to, uh, you gotta change, you gotta continually make things better. Um, so we need to be getting feedback um, so that we can make improvements. And, and so that whole idea of not asking people uh, about what was bad or what was good um, uh, really prevents this possibility of continuous improvement. Uh, so, so we're actually uh, uh, planning on, on serving all of these courses, these uh, Learn Moodle courses, on the same site um, uh, at learnmoodle.net someday. And, and the notion there is that you know we're all individually, we're all taking our, our own courses, we might have Moodle partners helping us with things. There's a whole variety of ways for us to, to take these courses. But, but we're, we're asking people for feedback, and that feedback is actually going someplace to our team that says, oh, it looks like that example was awful. You know, oh, it looks like no one liked that piece. You know, it's, it's, we've got a lot of feedback that we need to change this or have better examples. And, and that's where we then go in and make those changes. Uh, we're also really pleased that uh, we're tied to the European framework of digital competencies from the start. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's a very good uh, framework, uh, very detailed, makes a lot of sense. So, you know, it's that moment where, where you can say, uh, I'm teaching, um, uh, how many of these competencies am I actually touching? So, um, you know, we've, we've made effort to touch them all in our courses um, uh, and, uh, and, and to express that so, so our learners can see, you know, that they're very good at, at a lot of very important things. Uh, we are, and this is another time where you may choose to email me, I would love it. Uh, we're looking for accreditation frameworks in India that, that, that would be uh, interesting and, and similar. Uh, where, where you believe that accreditation might be tied to it. Um, because we do want to meet the needs of everybody, and, uh, and, and that often is something very specific that's issued from accrediting bodies. So if, if, if there are ways that we can tie our program into uh, accreditation frameworks uh, from here, please, uh, please let us know, and we'll begin work on that right away. So, you really can't leave out this really important idea about teaching and learning, which is that many of us perceive grand differences in what teaching and learning is. You know, some of you might have looked at this whole presentation as being touchy-feely, might have been strange and like uh, high flutin. I don't know. I don't know what the, the language would be, but. Um, uh, I, I, we're trying to accommodate that as well. And that's part of the questions, uh, reasons we ask questions. But um, can you see this grid on the screen, A, B, C, D? Is it too light? Okay. I'm gonna ask you a two question survey. I don't think you need to even write down on a piece of paper. But uh, uh, question number one will have A, B, C, or D as an answer, as, as your answer, there's no right and wrong. Question two will have A, B, C, or D as an answer, no wrong questions. But I'd like you to remember what the number was, or the letter. So, uh, this, is, this is getting at that whole idea that uh, we're, we're all gonna think a little bit differently about what schools are and what learning is. So in your mind, and, and a couple of these may be true simultaneously, but what is most true for you? Is an educational institution a place that, uh, where knowledge is transmitted to students. Here's some information you need to know. You got it? Good. That would be A. Uh, should an educational institution be a stimulating environment organized around the developmental needs of the students? Should an educational institution be students who are trained to function as constructive members of society? Should an educational institution be students who are perceiving problems in society and they're envisioning a better one and they're gonna act for social justice? So A, B, C, D, no wrong answers. I'm very curious what you guys come up with. 
So this is question number two. Educators should be expert practitioners, transmitting that which is known, right? You should know your subject. Or educators should be mentors to students, helping them to learn by presenting them with experiences from which they can make meaning. Or educators should be supervisors of student learning, utilizing instructional strategies that will optimize student learning. Or four, partners, educators should be partners with students contemplating the world and its problems in order to help the students learn. Okay, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hands yet. But uh, if you were A, and you went to Google, uh, and you typed in scholar academic, traditional teaching, and cognitivism, you would actually find a lot of really great research about uh, the kind of teaching you love. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a whole kind of world of pedagogy. Right? If you had answered with B, if B was the prominent one that you had, and you might have picked A and B, um, then Google both. Uh, but B is that learner-centered is important to you, that constructivism is important to you, and that open pedagogy is important to you. If you had chosen C, this is, uh, this is really a fascinating kind of social efficiency, where everyone's trying to you know, teach everybody everything they need to do. Uh, it's, it's great for workplace training. Uh, it's, it's behaviorism. It's intelligent tutoring systems. It's competency-based learning. It's self-paced learning. It's all of these things at once. All of those terms would, would really resonate with, with your teaching style, probably. And then fourth, uh, social reconstruction. This is D. Social justice, social constructivism, uh, transformative learning and effective outcomes would be fantastic Google pieces. Okay, hey, again, this is not a judgmental thing. It's connected to something. So uh, can I ask a show of hands, how many people uh, found A as being the dominant um, paradigm that they picked? Okay, I, I see no one. Okay, so that's a, that's a scholar academic program. It's very traditional. How many people found B, the learner-centered constructivism open pedagogy one? Ah, you are moodlers. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's great. Yeah, I mean, we're drawn to these things, right? We're drawn to these tools. We're drawn to these people, you know, and that fits really well. Social efficiency, a very, very common use of, of Moodle. How many people chose C? Yeah, absolutely. Do you, do you teach workplace or training or anything like that? Um, where do you teach? University of Mumbai. What is the subject area? Information technology, right? That's one of those uh, areas where you do want social efficiency. You want to make sure that uh, 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 your IT person knows everything, right? And it doesn't have holes because they went on a learning path somewhere, right? So, so very effective. And how many people chose social reconstruction, social justice, social constructivism. Yeah, okay, absolutely, yeah. You know, I, I think a lot of us have this relationship with our students where we're like, ah, you are brilliant, you have to go fix global warming, you know? And, and it's, uh, it's the excitement that's passed from student to teacher, from teacher to student. Um, so, again, in no way does the Learn Moodle curriculum want to say uh, one is better than the other? Because honestly, Moodle has so many tools, so many choices, because it's set up to teach in these four different methods at the same time. Okay? But as many of you probably know or think, there's a bunch of tools that you don't need and you don't want to see, and those are because they are in these other areas. Right? And there is the right tool for the right task, and, and, and it's liberating. Right? So we actually built all of those patterns based on these four structures. 
and we can tell you a learning path that you can go through the courses and say, this is for social efficiency. The other stuff is cool, but this is going to be useful, right? And then if you ever want to step out of your realm and try other stuff, right? I was in Australia, and, uh, and you know, uh, there was a police training uh, school, and they said, we're very social efficiency. And I was like, thank you. Um, and, and, and they said, but we want to talk about, you know, uh, meaning. We want to talk about ethics. We want to talk about these other pieces. Where would we borrow from? And I said, D, you know, go to social reconstruction and, and look at some of those tools that we have, some of these patterns that can help, you know, start those discussions and say, you know, uh, uh, what do we think this means? you know, um, in order for us to, to, to be better um, police. The other reason we think it, uh, a knowledge of approach is important is that we don't want you to go down the ro wrong road and get frustrated. You know, social efficiency can often be uh, uh, very effectively driven in Moodle by using quizzes and using great quizzes. But I tell you, if you've got 200 people that you need to teach uh, a social efficiency activity and you start assigning long essays, you know, that you have to give lots of feedback to, you're going to just, you're going to die. That's not a good thing to do at all, right? And so often people will use the wrong tools for the wrong approach for the wrong reasons. And, and they'll be very unhappy with the result. And you know, I think there's an opportunity for us uh, as, as experienced Moodlers from around the world to say, I wouldn't recommend that. That's not the best pattern for you here. So I'm wrapping up here. Um, we imagine uh, uh, creating these, these modules so that people can take the courses they want, the modules they want, to learn the things that they need in order to be stronger teachers. Uh, we know you're already teachers. We know you're already excellent drivers. Uh, these are some tricks that we think that everybody um, uh, usually experiences. And we're looking for uh, people to try them out and help us with continuous improvement, make them better, so that next year uh, the modules are even better. So um, I wanted to thank you for your attention. I know this wasn't a workshop. This was a lecture. This was very uh, scholar academic, A. Um, uh, but, but our next session is, is, is uh, more reflective as we're thinking about how we do things. Um, my name is Tom, and I'm at tom at moodle.com. And I'd love to spend time with you the next couple of days talking. It's usually easier to do that than a moot. And uh, uh, I'm, I'd be very happy to take questions if you have any. Yes. Simple things like how big a course needs to be. When do we need to split up courses? I mean, uh, very often we are, we are basically transferring the university curriculum into mm -hmm. similarly named courses. Mm -hmm. But that, that usually wouldn't work in, in many circumstances. And, and uh, I, I'm, I'm a doctor, but I'm not very well read about you know, what kind of research is going on in this area. But I find that there are very simple questions that don't have you know, any good guidance in, in terms of. Uh, right, absolutely. Um, so the question you know, about, uh, about length of unit. And um, I have to lean on uh, a number of uh, the researchers on my team, they would have better answers. Um, I think that part of it is, is what is that atomic piece of learning, right? Um, uh, when you're teaching Hamlet, is the atomic piece of learning the essay that you turn in? Or is it the essay you turn in and the discussion about Act 4? Or is it Act 4 and Act 3 discussion <laughs> And how far, how, how big a chunk do you want? I think um, 
uh, if, if, if you've got that sense of uh, what you're trying to do and it has a shape to it, 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 it becomes useful. Um, there's, a, there's an American um, uh, orchestra conductor, um, Xander uh, is his last name, and you can look it up on, um, uh, on the TED Talks. And he talks about one buttock um, uh, uh, piano playing, and I mean buttock, right? So, so what he says is that when you are first a piano student, that, and you play Chopin, that it's very clunky because the impulse is on every note because you're trying to translate the note to the keyboard. And as you get a little better, uh, uh, it's every other beat uh, that the impulse comes on because you have to think less and you're thinking more about where that song is going. And then in year three and year four, the impulses spread out until they just hit that musical phrase that you know Chopin wanted. You know, they're little notes and they're big notes. They're more important notes than others. And you get that phrase. And I think that's one way to, uh, oh, and he said, you know, when you get to that point where you've got a musical phrase, you lift yourself out of your seat a little bit. And, you know, it's a very musical thing to move. Um, and, and he said, that's kind of the place we want to be in our learning, you know, where, where the, the impulse is not necessarily on all the pieces but it's on the, the phrase. Now, I know this is very abstract, and you asked for some real research, which I can't give you at the moment, but I will. Um, uh, but I, I think right there is some of it, you know, how are we gonna talk about our teaching? You know, was it, was it those, those single impulses, or was it a phrase? Because I think the students that really get it are hearing the phrase, whether we meant to do it or not. You know, that's that moment where you're like, ah, I like that song. Um, but but um, uh, so so great question about what is too big and too small to do. Um, I think first we have to understand you know are we making the right music because that too is going to carry somebody on. They're going to be much more able to take in more information if they're if they understand the larger context of the notes. Um, but if you could leave me your card, I'll send you some research. Any other questions? So I have a question regarding this uh, European cu curriculum framework. Here in India, we have NCT. So all uh, uh, institutions uh, should follow National Council for Teacher Education curriculum. So how do how you are going to localize this? Mm -hmm. So and uh, you are uh, also saying. Delivered through Moodle partners, local partners. Mm -hmm. Who is going to facilitate this course? Mm -hmm. Who will add localized examples uh, yep. during online facilitation? Excellent. This is the first time that Moodle has done a curriculum um, like this. So we are, we had to build enough of it to know what it was. Um, and, and the next stage for us is, uh, and we've been gathering information at Moots from communities saying what's important to you. Um, and at this stage, we're going to present it to the partners and say, uh, can you help us with this? Um, as you know, at Moodle HQ, it's a very small group. It's, it's, it's I think, less than 60 people, and, uh, which is pretty amazing for like 124 you know, million users. But uh, uh, Moodle HQ does not want to expand and, and have huge amounts of staff. That's, that's what the Moodle partners are fantastic for. So I envision at least two paths. One is uh, Moodle partners who like the idea and they want to do this training and it's not redundant with what they do, uh, might be offering this. The second option is, is what Martin mentioned in his keynote, which is uh, more of a straight to school um, curriculum where, where you might say, uh, we see this as curriculum that we want to teach our teachers. Um, uh, and uh, so therefore, we'd like to license it almost as a curriculum itself uh, at Moodle HQ. Um, so I'm not uh, sure if that, uh, that helps exactly. We, we do plan to translate this into several languages, and we believe that uh, it'll be more than language that needs to change to, to be lo localized. I mean, the examples might have to be different. 
and so forth. Um, but, but that's all built into the system as something we're very interested in doing because there again, if, uh, if, uh, if India partners um, uh, taught the workshops one year and got all the feedback, you know, it would be improved that way too the second year and third year. We also know that we have to be continuously improving because Moodle always changes. And, um, and so we're balancing how, how the software changes and moves and, and, and what we're finding from teachers to be very effective and most useful and least useful. Some of those things from the list might very well fall off. Yeah. Can we reuse any of these modules? Yes. Are you going to release a, uh, with the CC license, Creative Commons license, content of these modules, any of these modules? At this stage, these are going to be uh, training courses that won't be released. Um, we do anticipate at some point making um, uh, Creative Commons pieces too. Uh, it, it would most likely be um, what would we would release right away would be um, uh, these, these patterns. So for example, if Moodle.net or Moodle.net without the dot uh, can facilitate um, people building course materials, like Martin said, then, um, and, and people are saying, I'm looking for examples of this pattern, you know, then, then we can make as many as we want in our community, and we can share all of those. So I think that would be stupendous, um, and, and I think it's a very quick way to learning, is uh, to, to uh, uh, for basically these, these programs would be developing materials that can be shared with everybody. Thank you. Uh, Tom, I think what Dr. Indira is trying to say is that if we were to train our teachers in using Moodle, then maybe the course that you're preparing may not be sufficient. So how do you localize it? And how do you make it appropriate? That was one. And second is, is it going to be tied into some of the Indian certifications? Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, there's no motivation mm -hmm. for an institution to actually make their teachers do this course. Right. So that second part is tougher. The first part is still more important that if, if, a, if so for instance, if my, one of our team of teachers who mm -hmm. log on to learn yeah. Moodle.net needs to be able to apply that knowledge right away in the institution. Yes. So some more localized content would be helpful. Yeah. Like some of my teachers have done the learn Moodle.net last year. You did it in August, right? Yep. Uh, they didn't become Moodle teachers after that. Right. So, so those are some of the challenges I think we face locally. Yeah. They, un they go through that course, mm -hmm. uh, they understand some of the tools, but they don't necessarily graduate to becoming course creators. Right, uh, right. So how do we bridge that gap yes. still? Yeah, I, so, so the o other localizations, right? So we've got language, we've got examples, we've got um, materials. Uh, they, they're all going to sit at the learn.moodle.net um, uh, site. Um, so. so um, can't localize, like put these courses on, on your server to, to put in. Um, uh, but, but we have anticipated the idea, for example, that someone doesn't call their Moodle Moodle, right? So, so the partners could probably go in there and change that to whatever special name the organization has used or, um, you know, focus on those pieces. But I think that, I think that um, uh, the pattern that we've created, you know, the pattern that I kind of walked through with those five sections, um, uh, is something that we hope people will take. If, if we're not teaching the things that everyone wants, you most certainly could use that pattern to teach the local things that, that you need and, and, and want most. I hope that helps. Yeah. All right, so this is Solange Lalonde, and uh, she will um, kind of follow up where, where I ended, and uh, thank you so much for your very uh, close attention. <laughs>